What we want to show in our masterclass is how to go from uh, a conversation and a sketch on a piece of paper to something that's performing on stage. So the masterclass that we're presenting today is trying to take people step by step through the journey of how to end up with something that is faithful in some way to your vision, even if it's not exactly what you thought you were going to make. All right, um, David's going to start. Yeah. <laughs> First thing to say is this is not uh, something we do every day, so it might be a bit raw. We've yeah. never done this before at all. That's true. That's <laughs> so um, we've done a number of projects together, and when we started, we didn't know really a lot about what we were doing. Certainly I didn't. So I think the best way to communicate that is to just take you through the history of some of these projects. So we'll describe the projects, and then we'll describe the process that we went through to realize them. I don't think we can describe what sort of set design is or stage design is. I think the probably more important to say is how to realize something. So you have an idea. Emmanuel, the ideas man. <laughs> um, but it's uh, how to realize something is, I think, um, hopefully more interesting. OK, so uh, uh, well, so we're going to start with the first, the first uh, yeah. thing we've ever done. So we'll start with Archimedes, which is the the first project we did. Um, as I said, was said in the introduction, if you have any burning questions, please just ask, because it will help us uh, help the narrative of the talk. So anything you want to ask, please do immediately. OK, so the story starts a little bit before. Um, so me and David were already friends, and we, um, David, uh, well, David's a friend of mine. Uh, and <laughs> um, I was working for like nightclubs and small bands in Manchester in the UK. Uh, one of which was a nightclub, um, a club night called Hoya Hoya, which this is a picture of what I had installed there, and this is a long time ago. This is like 2008, I think, maybe 2007. That was my my job, really. Um, I was just about living and getting by, and this um, event was very kind of forward thinking, and they got a lot of um, artists through that were cutting edge for the time and cutting edge for the for the for the music of the time. One of which was a man by the name of Alfred Darlington, also known as Daedalus, who wanted to, he had a show coming up and he wanted to develop something interesting for it. So he, for some reason, asked me amongst other people and we had a conversation. And just, just to clear up, so this is, the, this is what the Hoya Hoya setup looked like. It's actually very small. It looks much bigger in this picture. And Hoya Hoya ended, unfortunately. And this is us all. I just wanted to put that, no, back, right. Th this person here, is actually Afrodeutsch, who's playing at this festival later on, and I'm really, really proud of her for that. So Hoya Hoya ended, and uh, touring with Alfred began. And so I talked to Alfred, and I said, oh, I want to do a thing that's going to be not just smoke and mirrors, but like actually smoke and mirrors, because I thought that was really funny. And he thought it was really funny, too. He seemed to like language more than he, anything else. And, um, practicality. Yeah, he, practicality, he didn't <laughs> yeah. really mind so much. So I sent him a picture of like this thing, and he said, oh, that's wonderful. He didn't ask how big it was, or how heavy it was going to be, or how much it would cost, or anything. Um, and so I was like, great, we're going to make something insane. David, you're an engineer. You can, you can make me this, right? And David, unfortunately for him, said... I said yes. <laughs> uh, um, yeah. Well, I didn't, say, I, I didn't say yes immediately. No. No, we had a long bartering process. It was about maybe two hours, and then you know that took up the next few years of your life. Yeah, I did, like yeah. you, you gave a lot away in those first yeah, couple two hours. hours and five pints. <laughs> <laughs> the idea was to basically make a, a mechanical thing of mirrors. Initially, the idea was to make something much, much smaller that would have like thousands and thousands of little mirrors in it. It was gonna be like this glitter, this like living glitter ball, and then. Um, David explains to me the you know thermodynamics yeah. and you know the size and weights of things and that's completely impossible, um, at least anything like with the budget we'd or, have. Or not, yeah, not realizable for two people. For two people yeah. uh, who don't know what they're doing and yeah. yeah, and so the project changed shape a lot 
but it's weird how it actually, now that I look at it, it didn't end up that dissimilar from how it started, but it went through loads of different weird processes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this was the design, it's just made in SketchUp. It was like, this could be roughly how it, how it looks. Um, and this is how it ended. So this is the end of its life. And so we want to tell you the story of how it went from that being that picture to being this thing that was dazzling children in a, in a, in a courtyard in France. So the first part of the talk is going to focus on the, bit, on the story of this machine, and then we'll, we'll see what other um, things you guys want to know about. So the first thing that David had to do... <laughs> OK, so we started off with the idea of moving mirrors around. The first question was, why do we want to do it? We want to, we've got a light source. Uh, light sources are often static, or they're big moving head things, and you don't have many of them on a stage. The idea was to have lots and lots of small things that moved, um, like a big glitter ball. We, sort of, we had to find a place where we, to meet in the middle, where we had to decide how many things we were going to make, how big they were going to be, and what they were going to do. So the first thing was they have to move light. So after a lot of conversations, we came to the idea that panels of mirrors that move X and Y and up and down, that's going to be, that's the ticket. Which, in retrospect, seems obvious, but when you've yeah. never seen anything like, you've ever seen a mechanical stage show before, you've never seen anything with mirrors before. That's true. We went it through seem so many iterations. Like yeah, there was like, spinning mirrors. you have it spin, or you could have yeah. it just moving from just the edge, or there were so yeah. many different ways to approach it. Now it seems obvious that you'd move it from the center yeah. or not, but that wasn't obvious at all at the beginning. I, I think that was informed by looking at what was, uh, what was around, yeah, but yeah. also, say, what stage lights were around. So, sure. Um, lights with small moving mirrors that steer um, light around rather than, say, moving the whole head. Um, but we came to the idea of having the larger panels. So the first thing to do was to design something. So this is a CAD, this is the first CAD model of a, an armature that would move a mirror around, which I drew one day, well, over the course of many days actually, but while I should have been studying at university. Yes, you should have been. I was, I was doing this, yeah. much to the displeasure of my supervisor. <laughs> um, and very quickly, so this is the CAD model in the background, and this is the, the mirror thing in the front. So the thing is easy. I'm gonna, I've got some motors, no problem. I'm going to stick them together with some framework. Easy. I can, I can make these things. It's only when you actually put something together and you try and bolt it together and see where the screws are going to go and think, ah, dear. So this were, there were a few goes at getting this right. But the main thing was to, we've got to make lots of these things. So how can we make it simple to build? Um, how can I make it so I can build it inaccurately because I'm going to do this by hand? You're going to make mistakes, yeah. Oh, yeah. So I built, one, I built one, and we tested it out, and it did roughly what we hoped it would do. It, there, there were some problems, which we'll come to. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, this is a litany of problems, this whole process. Which is <laughs> why we're telling this story, because it has the most problems in it yeah. um, that we encountered. Yeah, so I think we've... Okay, so, we've so that was that piece... There. Um, uh, meanwhile, I'm still in La La Land. I'm sending like even larger prospects to uh, yeah. Dayless. I'm like, oh well, you know, maybe there'll be three of you on stage, and if you want to bring a drummer, and you know, we can have like <laughs> 80, oh, yeah, yeah. you know, 50 of these, and it'll be great. So um, I, I'm seeing these emails, thinking <laughs> how this stuff is floating in space. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so this is like the reality. This is just about what's real, and then this yeah. is like me going off somewhere else, yeah. and hoping that Planet they will join. Up. Yeah. The, the, the problem with SketchUp is that SketchUp is amazing, by the way. If, it, as a tool, you can pick it up incredibly quickly. Um, it's very intuitive, and you can really, you can get working really, really quickly. But it does so many things for you that make life so easy yeah. that before you know it, you, you just believe in a world where everything's perfectly straight and has right angles and everything just snaps to each other. And yeah, it doesn't tell you no, anything it about it. No, it doesn't tell you that actually that's not things aren't that straight and it's not going to work. And yeah. if you built this, it would probably like collapse in the middle or any of those things. It, it, yeah, it's not for doing this, but it's what I use. So we came up with something a bit more doable. So we, we came up with, an, I think this is the number that we ended up with. This is the, is this the correct number? Yeah. It's an arrangement of four by three. Okay, so, we have, so yeah, we ended up with 36. That was the first one, it was huge. Um, so, we had th so the initial <laughs> number we s settled on was had to be divisible by 12 just to make it easy to then yeah. deal with other things. Yeah. <laughs> Which is because it makes it easier to just think about. Um, yeah. So we ended up with three modules of 12 of these mirrors, um, so 36 total, that would have to live in some kind of cabinet. And so this is me sending um, imagery to Alfred about what, what's possible, what we could do. So now we're really starting to think about, well, how's it going to go on the stage? Yeah. How's it going to pack? 
how are we going to really realize this? It's, we've made something that moves. We've made one thing that moves. Looking at this thing, thinking, I've got to make 35 more of these. I, I think we had six at this point. I think we had like oh, a little yeah. bank of six. <laughs> Two of which started to show problems, which uh, we yeah. ignored. So the, the other main takeaway from this litany of uh, mistakes and uh, errors is that if something looks wrong at the start, go with your gut. Yeah. You're probably going to still be wrong as you keep yeah. going. This is something we discovered. D don't tell yourself, like, oh, maybe I'm unlucky. Maybe yeah. that was just what. No, no, ne no. Next time it will be okay. No, no, it won't. No, no. You're actually lucky that any of it works. The, the, the yeah. things that don't work, you need to deal with them right away. We had a bank of six, and I think two of the, two of the mirrors were just not really working. They kept shredding through the gears. There was just some issues with that, or like the mirror was too heavy, or it wasn't quite in the center. And we were just like, oh, well, you know, we'll deal with that as we get on. And, we, and um, so, so then this became the first like, stage plot that was sent out to, it was, in fact, it was Coachella um, that Daedalus was, was booked to perform as the headline act of the second stage. So th this whole project was brought about because he really wanted to have something for that particular show and then build something to tour up to that. So this was what was sent to Coachella very early on in the, pro in the process. So, like, this is roughly what we'll be bringing. In the end, there wasn't even three people on stage. It was just Alfred and his own. But this is how early in the process it was. It was just like, they wanted to know roughly would their stage be big enough. And we were like, well, you know, I hope so because this thing's huge. Ah, I'm going to carry it on my back, which I did do in the end, which was horrible. So the plan was to have these backing boards made out of, uh, out of wood in the US. Um, we live in Manchester, UK, by the way. That's yeah. kind of that might don't let my accent fool you. Um, so we, we would have the, the cabinets built in the US and we would fly over with all the mechanics, so with all the things that we have to build. And so this is a, uh, a set of 12 mirrors with an arm with a projector on the front of it, and the projector will bounce into the mirrors and the light will come off. So that's, and then at the bottom you can see the little boxes, those are the brains, and those, th you didn't let me make those legs like that, did you, in the end? Because no. they were going to snap, weren't yeah. they? Yeah. Yeah, I think we sucked those off. I don't think we had the legs at the bottom, I think that it was just flat on the floor. Yeah. Because that wouldn't have worked. Yeah, okay. Um, and so this is us looking at how it's going to come apart because obviously it's got to move between shows. You know, the mirrors will come off and the motors will come off so that it can all rattle around in the van without falling apart. And it was quite nice. The two like backing things would like face into each other and then slot together. And then that would make us like a big box to, sit, to yeah. keep all the mirrors inside of. So we're like, we're super optimistic at this point. Yeah. It's all really fitting together really nicely. Really nicely, yeah. It's still not quite in the real world yet. Yeah. So all these things, tes they tessellate. They tessellated, which is wonderful. Wonderful. So and they did. They just also liked being together a lot. Oh, they did, yeah. Yeah, they really, st when, we when we did put them together, we couldn't get them apart again. Um, we'll come to that, I think. <laughs> so I think probably what we're saying here is that we're still in the virtual world here, and we've not really, and we're, we're like getting ready to actually go and do the thing. And we think it's going to be okay, but um, and we're optimistic. Yeah. So the next oh. thing we do is we fly out with all the bits that we need, so all the motors and, and like it's a lot of stuff. And David's made all the um, so just in this picture. I yeah. So just to say how how we actually made all this stuff because I was working at a university at the time, so I was quite I had the privilege of quite a nice machine shop. I was able to manufacture a lot of these things myself. Anyone who's wanting to actually make hardware, it is not as hard as you think, because there are lots of sort of fab lab type places around that are really well kitted out for this stuff. I was just lucky that I had access to university um, facilities. So we have these boxes of um, mechanics that we've at this point tested quite a lot, but um, they've not been on the road. Uh, we're, still, we're still optimistic. Um, we've made all the electronics, so Wrote in uni friends to help out making electronics. Um, oh yeah, you, to, you were like learning DMX. Yeah, yeah. Like so what is DMX? Okay, let's find out. Yeah, really. So we think, well, I've got these motors. I want to move the mirrors around. So I've got to learn. Well, how do I? Motors need signals, so I've got to figure that one out. So long process of um, working out how to drive them, how to communicate with them, what a stage, what what's get what gets used on staging. It's like DMX. A because huge process. then you don't have to run a line. That was basically it. Yeah. Like you've, you've already got a line on the stage that's a DMX line so that you can already send signal. So although it wasn't the best thing to use, it was like when, when we're arriving in a venue, we can just use DMX. Yeah, so Later on, 
you know, that was before Ethernet was very common. We you couldn't get cat fiving in, in venues. Yeah. It wasn't that common. Um, so that was what we. It's also it's lovely and simple. So it's. it's and yeah. for people who don't know, DMX is just it's just the kind of cable you use to control lighting. That's that's. Yeah, it's super. We're old. just repurposing stuff that's already existing. Yes, yeah, it's and it's really good. So we've got these uh we've got these boxes that arrived um in our in incredible smuggling company that we found. Um, that sent, <laughs> sent all our stuff to the U.S. as if they were personal effects, which was wonderful. Um, and including a bag of nuts, which, which, which <laughs> they were worried we about. They I don't think we've we got time to food. go into the bag of nuts. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, so this is a pile of stuff on Alfred's friend's floor, so we we're starting to assemble the thing. This is the next mistake we made, is assembling the thing on tour. So we'd set, we worked out, yeah, this is going to work. So we shipped all the parts over, and we'll assemble it there. Great. It's going to be fine. No. I mean, we did it, uh, but that was, like, that was mm. such a sting of a learning process. We did it because a lot of people were like, um, yeah, I, I guess you can do this yeah. here. Yeah, that, that'll, yeah. I'm sure that'll be okay. We hadn't planned ahead for there to be like a dedicated space for us to work in. Not we really. Thought that we would just um, do it. So uh, th here we have the, um, the manufacturing of the... The, of the wooden cabinets that will support this thing. Yeah. Right? That's, that's, so that's the next thing that happens is we encounter the person who's received the designs to make the wooden cabinets, and you can see him there um, working away along with me with shorter hair. We just, we just got all the stuff in a car. I um, won't say particularly which one. And <laughs> we brought it all in and started assembling it on the floor, and the guy was like, you know, this is my workshop. You can't yeah. really do this. But he was generous in the end and let us do it. So, I mean, I, th I think, I mean, at this point, it all basically come together. We'd, we'd figured it out. Um, so we put the thing together. So these, these are the, um, the boxes here. Everything's going to get screwed in. Uh, it's going to get put together, and it's going on tour. Like, it's, it's done. Um, and this, so this is our first big project together yeah. that, that, we, that we did. Um, what comes next after this? After this, we are... Oh, yeah. It's just, so pr proof, just proof that I'm not just the ideas, man. This is me doing stuff. Yeah. And David doing stuff. Yeah, and, and so this is what we ended up with. And, and this is the first time we see it together, <laughs> which is crazy that we hadn't <laughs> done this before. <laughs> we just arrived in LA yeah. um, with all these bits and then assembled it. It's like, oh, I guess that's what it looks like. I had no idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> it, it, it looked cool. The from yeah. the front, from yeah, the yeah, front. Yeah. It from, looks from, the back, from the back, you can tell that we hadn't seen this before. Yeah. Um, but from the front, it looked cool. It looked yeah. Really cool. Um, uh, so a picture of it yeah. in the front. Okay, so this is it from the front, and the the, the, the blurry figure there is uh, Daedalus. Um, is there another picture? Oh no, that's the next problem. Okay. So I think uh, I think that's the end of the. So this is the end of the first part. So yeah. Um, this, so this is the machine actually working. The first show it was it did it was in in Dallas, um, uh, Dallas, Texas, um, and we discovered something wonderful about our design which is that we'd only ever seen them all, all the mirrors moving at the same time. Uh, we'd never seen them moving against each other, and they actually liked to bang into each other. So we then had to cut them to make them fit without hurting each other, which meant doing that whilst on the road. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, okay, I think we've, f we've probably focused a little bit too much on all of the, the horror. Of this, <laughs> the this horror project. is the best the, bit. I think there the are loads of really beautiful pictures you can yeah, Google. The, the, so the main thing is, so we, we, we came up with this, um, you came up with this sort of concept, and we, we managed to put it together mm -hmm. um, quite naively, but it did look really amazing. Yeah, totally. Yeah, um, but it was very, very mechanical, very big machine and super fragile. I think, have you, is there, super the, fragile. Is there the picture of you fixing it? Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. So the, this is me on tour with... Uh, Henry, now known as Shlomo, who was our support act at the time, and now is doing incredibly well. And we would stay up till 6 a.m. and rue the day that we decided to go live on a bus for two months. Me while fixing stuff that I didn't... At this point, David had gone back to Europe um, because he had to go back to his job, and I was off on tour. And so I had to fix things on the road that I'd never... I'd never I didn't know how to fix. I, I didn't have the background for it. So David's just kind of talking me through everything and sending, like, replacement bits to the next show and we're arriving as a FedEx package and he'd hide little notes for me in there, really sweet ones. So that show toured. It did good work. After that, we took stock, all the things that we'd gotten wrong. So 
The concept was really great. It was such a simple concept. Big moving machine, moving light around on a stage. What's not to like? Yeah. But the machine itself was very, very fragile. It was the first, the first go. We didn't spend enough time. We didn't trust our testing. So the, the motors themselves kept breaking because we didn't, please. Yeah. Uh, how much time? We sp uh, it spent three months on the road uh, touring, and it took us how long? Six months to build? Less than that. Do you think we we were doing it at break breakneck speed, dude? Yeah, I think we built it in sort of maybe five or six months. Yeah, I, I think the first conversation with Alfred happened in like January, and we were on the road in like March. It, it, it you know, we were we were building in March, and then we had to be on this tour that was going to finish in Coachella like May. It was like, you know, you sit someone in a pub and you mention like, oh, we could do this, and then. Four months later, you know, you're like, yeah. oh my God, this is actually Why you're doing this. How the hell am I here? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so, so we got back, and uh, some time passed, and we thought, we'll have another go. There was, we had opportunity to have another crack at it. So, same concept. So we, we built a new machine, but with, uh, with much more robust. We learned so much. It's, so, the first thing we're going to show here is um, just the, the new mechanics. So, Everything broke, so we made it again. So, oh, first thing, so the zeroing routine, he does it on its own now, because the moment. Oh, just a, this is me sending a video to Alfred so that he knows where we're up to. Yeah, and this is the uh, first time it's worked. It's not able to break itself, so it starts up here, and then you turn the power on, click the little joystick in, and that sets off the routine. Oh, basically. The table's kind of wobbly, so the camera's probably shaking a bit. So the yeah. reason we're showing up with this video is that he had lost a lot of faith in what we were doing because the mechanics that we'd made previously broke. Kept and so kept breaking, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we had a, quite a lot of ground to make up, so it's why we made this sort of promo. As you can see, it's pretty fast. Uh, <laughs> yeah, a lot really, of fun with that. Really fast. <laughs> um, this time. So now we have something that like looks actually quite impressive. Like it's actually like wow, this thing's actually working the way that they do on these cool YouTube videos that I keep seeing about people who create stuff. Um, and it's like, always, oh, now it's actually like, it's strong and it can resist your yeah, hand. You never, see, you never see the failures. No, no, you never, cool no, you just videos. see it when it's good. So that was uh, the second part of that video um, where I'm just demonstrating that it can actually hold a mirror. Well, we don't have a mirror at that okay. point. This time we're going to use a Schubert Symphony record sleeve. Yeah. So uh, we uh, it? Uh, keep it playing. <laughs> um, Symphony number eight in B minor. But it's, you've got two voices at the same time. Okay. okay. So we, it worth saying, we learned our lesson here with testing <laughs> with Schubert. <laughs> with Schubert. Yeah. Good. <laughs> I like the other sleeve better, but uh, it was too thick, so the magnets didn't work. We're going to stick this on with magnets. Oh, I see. You yeah. love magnets. One magnet there. Right, so this, the mirror is this uh, 12 inches. How much is that in a foot? In centimeters? It's a 12 inch record, so. I was going to say one foot. <laughs> is it, is, is it, it's just under a foot, right? No, 12 inches is one foot. It's one foot, okay. <laughs> so the real mirror is, you know, obviously. I saw this, units through and through, isn't it? Shut up. The real, so the real mirror is like out to, you know, here. Not, you probably can't see that, but. Okay, so. <laughs> just an impression of. We could probably, it might not move as fast as this in the finished piece, but um, it can, basically. <laughs> Again. Okay, so proof that it works. Well, proof, yeah. some kind of proof. Yeah. Um, this okay. isn't to say we didn't have any problems, but it was certainly a lot better. The, uh, the next thing that we needed to address was the fact that the structure of the, of the... It had to be, whenever we wanted to move it on any kind of plane, we had to have it rebuilt wherever we were going. Um, which is in, insane. It's just too, it's too much to deal with. So we had to rethink the way that the, the, the thing was held together. And so we did research and we've dis we discovered the world of aluminium extrusion, which is a wonderful invention where you can basically make... You can make anything you make you want. Anything you want. <laughs> and once you start working with this stuff, whenever you go to an airport, 
and you get to the security thing where they take your bags, you just notice that the whole world is just made out of aluminum extrusion. That's everything. Yeah. Very Every like custom modular. thing. Yeah. Um, so we so we got we designed it around extrusion. Um, we went through a few different types. We went, we ended up with this particular company, and uh, so we're now using a framework that's going to be a skeleton rather than a big board. And oh yeah, that's <laughs> that. we also um, the mirrors were too heavy as well. They were acrylic mirrors. Uh, there had to be something lighter, which there was. There were these mirrors that were designed for um, uh, solar foils, solar uh, solar collectors. No, it was solar collectors, but for uh, for in space. It was mylar. Oh so this yeah. this material called mylar, which you've seen like birthday balloons made out of. It's kind of uh, it's so it's generally you, it's quite silly, but uh, there is like a pretty pro version of it that the company make for actually making decent mirrors, and um, they're really light because it's just an aluminium frame, and then it's just this skin just stretched over the front of it. They're not as quite as, um, they can't take as much of a beating as, uh, as uh, acrylic mirrors, but they're really light. So therefore the motors could, yeah. would be, it would fly even lighter, it would uh, put less strain on the motors, you know, it would have all these advantages. Yeah, it was like, it was a major preoccupation with the design at this point, is that, so the, any design needs a constraint. So if you're unconstrained in your conceptual process, the sky is, kind of the limit, but you just can't get there. So the constraint at this point was weight. So weight and packability. It needs, it needs to be break down into little bits that we can throw into bags, and it needs to break down into 21 kilo bags that can go on a plane, because we need to travel with the thing. And so those were our design constraints. It's not how many how much light we want to move around, or how many lumens, or anything Or how like cool this. is it going to be? Yeah, or how cool it is it now? It's how are we going to get it there? Yeah. It's, it's calling an airline and saying, how, what is the maximum amount of bags that you allow one person to fly with? Oh, it's 10. OK, what are the maximum dimensions? Oh, it's length plus width plus height equals 158. OK, so these are like really serious constraints. If you go outside of these constraints, you're going to find yourself just paying excess charges left, right, and mm -hmm. center, or having stuff lost, um, which happens sometimes. Yeah. And yeah. So it really helps to basically work out what it is that the project was to be able to break it down into, into what can actually be done. And so that's, that's, what there, that's when everything started to make a lot more sense once, once the sky stopped being a limit. And we could actually go like, it has to be this big, weigh this much, go this, you know, take this long to put together and this long to take apart. And then you can learn to answer those questions. There are mirrors. Um, the, the oh, yeah. bedroom with all the motors. Yeah, this is all making all the new hardware. And new brains. Everything was nice and like, great and you know, robust and oh wow, it was, it, was, it was exciting. And then so we, we built uh, the first section of it which um, in Islington Mill which is a, 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 like an art space in, in Manchester and we had this video made. Of it. And now we have a cool video to go with it. Yeah, yeah, slick. Um, and so the thing is, like, we've learned our lessons. So we have did a horrendous first go um, that looked really cool. We did the testing, and we followed the results of our testing. Things that worked, we kept. Things that didn't work, we got, we, rid, of. We got rid of. And, and that's, that's really key, is keeping an eye on what it is that works. It might not be the thing that you want to work. It might be something that you don't, you don't, e that you, you don't even care about. But if it works, it's, you need to pay attention to it. And this became our new stage plot. It's much more professional. I'm getting much better at, at SketchUp. I'm using really color. SketchUp, yeah. You know, it's like all, yeah, I, yeah. I love my stage on, plots. On point. Yeah. Um, and this is yeah. like a plot of how it's going to fit into a car. Uh, I think that's a, yeah. It's, it, was, it, 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 it might well be, <laughs> actually, Dave. Um, <laughs> um, so we had two versions of the show, depending on what, how big the stage was. We had a, a smaller version and a larger version. As you can see, they're both about the same size in terms of packing. Um, is exactly how many you know bags they are, how big they are, how much they weigh. Everything became very like solid and doable, and less just kind of oh, I hope things work out. Um, and this is us setting it up for I think was our last show with Alfred in Knott's, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and and here is it. Here it is actually in Sonar. Um, I think Sonar were the first really big festival to book the big show, and that, that's really kind of what what helped us for the. Like, know that we had this goal. Like, we're going to play at Sonar in about three months. Let's, you know, that's going to be amazing. Let's make sure it's amazing for that. Yeah. Um, so we have this kind of much more serious, like, complete object that at this point we've rigged and re de-rigged hundreds of times and we're yeah, quite we, good we, at. We practiced. We practiced, yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, it looked amazing. Uh, we were really happy with it. You're, you're, never, you're never completely happy because there's always mistakes, but like it was, it was definitely a triumph. Yeah. And it went on to tour for, for years, th years thereafter and led on to every project that came up um, thereafter. Just using them as lights. I, I know it's, it's, very, it's a very common thing to do right now, but um, uh, at the time, it, it was something that I was doing at Hoya Hoya because we didn't have any space to put a screen, but we had a deep stage. So I just turned the projectors around and pointed them that way and then used the transparent screen, which is it's very common now, but it wasn't done very much. I think it was, like, it was like a couple French guys that were doing this kind of technique. I just learned to just use projectors as just a light source. It's like a moving head or... Um, it, the imagery itself doesn't really matter. It's kind of what the quality of the it light is. It wasn't really any imagery, out. was it? It's geometric yep. shapes, nothing complex. Yeah. Because it, it's not reproduced really at all. And, and, and also the machine itself is so complex, you don't want to have any kind of competition, v visual competition with the light. You know, the light should be simple or the light should be complicated and the machine should be simple. It's got to be one of those. These are pictures David took of the, yeah, the wonderful... The, the, the bit I'm interested in. Yeah, yeah, the bit that you like. Hey, you did a really good job. Um, and it ended up its life as a bit of kinetic sculpture um, at a festival in France in the, the courtyard of a castle, which I thought was a really good send-off. Yeah, very nice. Uh, could people please ask some questions about which shows you want to know about, because there are loads of shows. Could, so could someone say what it is that they want to know? Uh, oh, sorry, could you wait for the microphone? Uh, you were involved in Container with Evian Christ That's right. in Liverpool recently. Where did the idea start? I was lucky enough to go. So. You were there? Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> I, wa I, wasn't, I wasn't about an hour after it, but yeah. uh, it's quite intense. Well, I mean, well, thank you. That's the, that's the whole like, plan for it, was to try to create a, a, an experience that even if you... Even if you don't like it, it you're definitely going to remember why you didn't like it. It's difficult to say where things come from. Basically, Josh, who's Avion Christ, is really interested in extreme experiences. Um, and he, he likes the aesthetic involved in that. And he didn't know very much about light. And I didn't know very much about the kind of sound world that he was involved in. So over the course of us working together, we discovered more and more and more about what can actually be done as far as like pushing the limit of what you know, a club could be. And so kind of, you know, he's very much into de like deconstruction and, and finding these like little emotional slices or, you know, cruel parts of imagery or whatnot. And I'm kind of doing the same with imagery. I'm always interested in like either what's going to be the most beautiful thing or what's going to be the most horrible thing. All the stuff in the middle, that's day-to-day -day life. That's everything else. You know, I wanna, when I pay money, I want to cry because I'm in pain or because I'm in pleasure. It's got to be one of these. And when we, me and him really agree on that. And the, cont the container concept is kind of like that's what our... We were touring with the Strobe Show. That's what the Strobe Show would be if only we could get someone to basically tell us, sure, we've got a container, come over here and do this. So we, and we had the opportunity to do it in Liverpool um, for three or four times in a row. Yeah. And it was, you know, it, it was like, th like this is the perfect version of what it is we were trying to do. Um, and we yeah, were very lucky to have it happen. And I'm, and I'm glad you were there. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yeah, I think it's, it's awesome. Really. Worth explaining what it was. Uh, yeah, it's a it shipping works. container full of, completely full of smoke, so you can't see, you can't see your nose. And... Uh, Multicolored strobe lighting. 30 kilowatts worth of strobe lighting. Yeah. For like two hours. Yeah. Uh, maybe, I think it was like three hours. Horrendous. All the, all the lights were in the wall though, weren't they? Yeah, there was, a, there was no, no, we were, we were using actual strobe lighting. We had a, uh, an LEDs. L there was an LED screen along the wall, yeah. but I don't, could you even see that? Yeah, because well, the strobe and the smoke obviously made it impossible to see anything. But then you'd get up to the wall. But then the colors of the wall completely changed what you could see, so it was constantly changing to just different colors all the time. Okay, so, 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 so you couldn't see what's actually on the screen, but you could see it affecting the, the atmosphere that you yeah, were in. Yeah, it was just the main color that you could see and then flashing. Yeah. So yeah, that, oh, I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yeah, it awesome. <laughs> awesome. I'm glad that you're talking about this experience with a smile on your face, you know, rather than a, <laughs> yeah. rather than a why did you do this to <laughs> me? <laughs> did you go yourself? I, I was there, yeah, yeah. yeah. I was there. I, you, you wouldn't have seen me because of the amount of smoke, but I was behind the booth with Josh. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. Cool. Uh, for all three hours, oh, loving it. Amazing. I mean, at this, if, if I love it, someone else has got to love it, even yeah. if it's on at paper least a horrible thing. Yeah. <laughs> 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 on paper, it is a horrible thing. Oh, yeah, but it was, it was yeah. great. I loved yeah. it. Cool. Um, Thank you. You're welcome. Is there any, anything else that anyone would like to ask about? Any video you can show about this? Sorry? 
Excuse me, any video you have to show us? Um, it's, it's difficult to show videos of the Archimedes because they're all uh, performances, which we can't really show here. But if you want to look on YouTube, there's loads. Yeah, there's if you yeah. just Google Archimedes Daedalus, um, okay, yeah. or any, or any of the shows, yeah. like the, there's plenty of content there. It's just, yeah. it, it's just co really complicated getting permission to use all this different stuff apart yeah. from our own pictures. Right. And because and we're working on the shows, we're not taking video. So sure. there, it really isn't, we don't have any video, unfortunately. <laughs> Thanks anyway. Sorry. L let's show some the well. Okay, well so uh, the, another project that the two of us worked on together was the, was the well with Corliss, um, which also came to Sonar at the same time as uh, a, a previous Avion Christ show. After the Archimedes, Archimedes was a really big, just a machine. And the fact it was a machine really kind of dominated the, the, the sort of the aesthetic of it, in a sense. That it moved light around was super cool, uh, but it was very much uh, an object in its own right. Uh, the next project we did um, was more, we wanted to focus more on the actual, the light itself. What can be done um, with, some, with an object that's not quite so um, sort of invasive in a way in, into the space. So we started playing around with Mylar, because at this point we love Mylar. Mm -hmm. And so we made a, a parabolic mirror. Um, a vacuum formed parabolic mirror. A vacuum mirror. formed parabolic uh, mirror. Um, this, you just cannot tell what this is just, at all. It's just, it's just weird. Parabolic yeah. mirrors are just really, really weird. They're just really interesting. Sir. And, and you can't tell when they're like shaving mirror size, but yeah. when you get them big enough, they just, yeah, they, they're crazy. really strange. So we really started to play at this point. So we've. Um, we've got a, certainly I've got a taste for it, <laughs> and having done uh, the Archimedes project, and we want to do something that's a little sort of could be more conceptually subtle than a thumping great big moving machine. Mirror machine, which is yeah. like, it was, that's what it was always called, like the mirror machine, the yeah. robot mirror yeah. machine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is just doing some tests for what happens yeah, to light as it goes in. More testing. More testing. We've more learned testing. all about testing at this point. So we and then, uh, but then we go, then we, then after then we go on to build the the wooden one. Yeah. So uh, at this point, so we've made a small one. Um, we think it's really great. So obviously, we're gonna make a big one. Mm -hmm. um, so we made two. So the idea here was to see um, what we really wanted to try and do was create standing waves oh. on the mirrors to move the light around. Uh, we didn't manage to do that, but we did manage to make something that's, that was really cool. That was, that was really cool. Okay. Yeah. So this is us making the two mirrors. Um, see how they're kind of put together. Um, that's we borrowed a laser, and then we had Archimedes, so we just tested it with it. Oh, so this is some video of Archimedes working, actually. Um, yeah. Because we weren't doing a show. We just had the laser, so we were like, oh, we need to see what it looks like. And uh, Yeah, we had a lot of fun. This is a great machine. Um, but I'm aware that we're not running out of time, so let's, let's yeah. try and go through. Um, so this is the secondary mirror. V um, without... Um, uh, repeat the question. Yeah. Can you repeat the question? Like, how, lo how loud the machine was it, it was on stage? It was amazingly loud, but when, it's, when the sound's on, you couldn't hear it at all. But we were so close to actually miking it up, because the sound it made was so eerie. And, and, and we still might do that. It might, yeah. come, it might come out of retirement as, a, as an instrument more so than as a, yeah. more than a, as a um, backdrop. We, one, one thing we had great uh, fun doing is turning the thing on without telling anyone we were going to turn it on. So there'd be lots of stage uh, engineers like around. Walking around. Walking around. And then we turn it on. And it was... <laughs> and it makes this epic noise when it turns <laughs> on. And everyone jumps. And we laugh. So the everyone stops. And it's like this thing's just going... <laughs> it's yeah. amazing. Yeah, so the question was like, what kind of budget are we working with here? Shoe, so sort of like shoe string. Uh, for, for which project? For Archimedes? For making these, these parabolic mirrors and stuff, and, and also the Archimedes, really. Okay, so, well, Archimedes is obviously much more expensive because there's so many moving parts. Um, I don't, I can't, I mean... I, the, I, I don't remember how much we spent. We, we were certainly in the tens in, of in thousands. tens of thousands of dollars, yeah. Um, um, we, I think it's probably fair to say that we did it as a labor of love rather than a, a money-making exercise. Well, good, because if we made it as a money-making exercise, we totally failed. Like, we, yeah. we, we didn't make a penny yeah. off of it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, yeah, it was certainly not cheap. 
but um, we did find ways to uh, economise. But yeah. so we were in the tens, tens of thousands. And then for this project, I think it was just a few. Yeah, it, it, th th for this one, it started off being very, very cheap and very simple. Um, we had a very small amount of money that was uh, donated to us by a festival. He wanted to commission a piece. And you know we'd been talking about this parabolic thing, so we were like, okay, well, um, it's just about enough to basically build the thing with the, with the amount of money that we've been given um, as a proof of concept. And then once the proof of concept was there, we liked it so much, we then wanted to develop it and we looked for more funding, et cetera. Um, but so yeah, move. so th this is David uh, attaching a, uh, a speaker to the back of the secondary mirror, the secondary motor. Yeah. And so this is kind of what happens when you shoot a laser into a parabolic mirror and you're looking at the reflection of another mirror that's got a base that's got a, a sub-bass frequency going through it. So here we're trying to create standing waves. Um, we don't, I don't think we really manage it, but... So w what we're doing here really is just to find out what we can do with um, the things that we've made. So we know we've, got a, we've made a lens a mirror that's basically a lens which focuses a, sp a, a spread laser. So we've got a scan laser, we shine it into the mirror, and then this focuses it into a column, which is um, cool in itself. And then we are shining that into a mirror with this speaker in to see what we can then do with it, how it interacts with um, people watching it, how it interacts with the room. So and, uh, how does it look? How does it feel? Yeah. So this is us setting it, setting it up with our two, our two mirror system. This is the festival that you, you, you were... Uh, the festival that booked, they, they commissioned this piece. Um, and they commissioned this piece and then I've, I, we needed some sound, right? So we had this sound gener we had this tone generator that was producing all the standing waves. But it wasn't really that interesting for a, uh, an installation. So I asked a friend of mine who played at Hoya, whose name was Corliss, or Lewis, um, if he would, because he would like making weird stuff, would you mind making a soundtrack that played around with these kind of frequencies for our installation? And he was actually booked to play at the festival, which I hadn't really realized, along with Evian Christ. And they were friends, so they both came down and they both decided that they were going to create like a live soundtrack for this instrument, which uh, they did. So, we, so we, we, we moved away from the tone generator at that point. Yeah. That's the effect we, we did the whole thing around, isn't it? Yeah. We wanted to be able to bring light back to this like single point. So, the, okay, these are pictures of us basically playing with the, uh, <laughs> with the machine to see what we can now what we can do with it. This is, this is the best picture of yeah. it. So this, get, this shows you the box in the middle, that's the laser. The, len the mirror at the bottom, that's the, that's the lens. Later. Yeah, it's the collimator. And then the, we've got the, the mirror at the top there, and that's, uh, the skin on that is, vi is being vibrated by the base driver in the back. So, so what you end up with is just this continuous spear of light that looks like it's coming out of a hole in the wall and going into another hole in the wall. And you can see it more clearly in this picture. I could speak a bit too dark, perhaps. But yeah, so once you've collimated the light, you've got this continuous, this continuous shape. The soundtrack being played was being played through the speaker, so that would affect, it would have like a kind of real, wor real world effect on what was happening to the laser. And that would have a response on the kind of, on where the light would go in the room. So this was a really, a real iterative process. So we, we played with the thing a lot. We, just to work out what it, what it was gonna do. We're still at prototype stage here. So we've made these things in wood. We've done it in wood because it's pretty safe. We're not trying to make something to tour here. It's something we know is gonna work. Um, and we've made it. Um, what we're looking at here is the decision has been made. Yes, this so, is, this so is gonna have a life. So Lewis, Lewis um, has decided that he really wants to do something with this concept, and, but therefore it has to tour. So we need to, we need to once again rebuild it away from wood and towards our newfound friend extrusion and be able to have it disassemble and assemble and um, how much is it going to weigh, back to all the old questions, how are we going to fly this thing, how are we going to move it around. And this is uh, a show we did in a church in Prague, I think. Um, this is us putting it together. So, uh, yeah, worth saying. So, we, so now it's made, uh, it's completely modular. It comes apart in eight sections. These all break down. This goes in one hold all for the whole thing. Uh, we have these... In Nor like, were they two meter beams? Yeah, two meter long beams. Two meter long beams. They have to travel in a fishing rod case. Which affectionately known as the bazooka. Yeah. Uh, very, the very airport people would always look at this just this 
it looks like a weapon. It yeah. definitely looks like a weapon. We never told airport people it was a bazooka, though. <laughs> no. We, were, we let them say we, that. We, whis- we whispered it. Though. Also, at this point, we've decided um, it's a single mirror now because it has to tour. We can't rig two mirrors that have to face each other in a venue in an hour. And, and in a completely precise arrangement as well. They yeah. have to be directly facing each other. If they're, if they're offset, they don't work anymore. forgot to say earlier when we showed the rigging of the prototype is that it took two days to work out how we were going to string it up, how we were going to align them. You think, oh, it's easy. We'll just face them with each other. It's not easy. Oh, man. Not easy. Yeah, that was... Sort of 40 kilo thing that you've got to arrange into a precise yeah. like, orientation. It's not yeah. easy. So uh, the, the two mirror thing was so cool. It was. But not it would, practical. It would have killed us. Yeah. And that's kind of what it looked like from the front. And this is it at, so- at Sonar in 2012, um, which was really early on in its life, actually. Again, Sonar kind of... One, one of the effects we found that we can see here is that as we stretched the mirror, we had control over the vacuum, so we could release it. And we very, very quickly realized that, firstly, once you've drawn a really good lens, you can't really do it again. So you've got to be careful when you do that because the mylar is it's disp- it's, um, consumed by the process. Yeah. Um, but once it's slack, then it projects these sort of like uh, patterns. Caustic, onto the caustic patterns, caustic yeah. reflections. So this was a really happy, happy accident. And here is it again, uh, in a room upstairs, I think, actually. Um, and that's what it did. You can see it bulging at the bottom. That's the amount of pressure so it's underneath. At this point, we have decided that we want to inflate the thing as well. Mm. So Emmanuel called me up and said, I want to be able to blow. It's su- surprisingly hard <laughs> to move that amount of air because um, it's, it's very porous. We tried our best to make it sealed, but it's, it's made out of A-sections and rigged in an hour. So yeah. Loads of holes. Um, but so again, this is the, the iterative process of it. We've seen what's fun and what's, what's you know, visually fun. And so what's the next thing we can do with the thing that we have at hand? And inflating it. We can inflate the, it. Yeah, was, was the thing. Um, and so I guess we'll close on this picture, um, which, which again was taken here. It was, the, it was my favorite picture of the whole project. Um, as it went all over the world, but that I, I still feel like the, the, the best show that it did was right here, actually. And it, unfortunately, that never really got topped. Sorry? The cost of the... Yeah, one parabolic mirror that you had to make, because you made two, right? Okay. What no, no, we made one. We, so made there, there, was one. A, there was one collimating mirror, and then one that was just a drum with a skin, a yeah. skin and a speaker. How long does... I mean, like, how much was it... Uh, not sort of like, I know you mentioned you said, like, we had tight budget and stuff like this, but um, on what kind of time scales does it take to sort of make... In fact, how do you, you know, how do you, how do you source a firm to make them? And, and, uh, so and we, what, what, sort of we work with a few manufacturers in Manchester, but we did most of the work ourselves. So in terms of, say, getting the extrusion made, we, we buy the extrusion from someone, then we go and find someone to, to roll it. And they looked at us like we were mad. And, but they did it. They did it. And then they cut it up, and then I took it to, to university because we needed to drill some holes in it and stuff, so I did it there. But you don't have to have a university to do these things you can um, do this like Fab Lab, but we did it very much ourselves. We didn't commission this for someone to do. And I don't think it would be feasible to do it that way. It would cost no. way too much money. And, and, and also, you'd completely lose control over what it is that you're doing. Yeah. Because yeah. Y- when you commission someone to do something, well, like so, so an artist is commissioning me to do something, he kind of loses control over what it is that I'm going to do. Um, so if I pass that on, on to someone else, the same thing happens to me. So you mm. kind of have to keep your hands on everything. So I th- and it, if you can't afford to pay yourself to do it, then you can't really afford to pay yourself to do it. But you have to do it with, you kind of have to do it that way. W- once you, I think once you farm out too much stuff to other, to other experts, th- th- they're going to come across problems that are actually like a good thing and they won't spot it because they're, t- they're a bit too busy trying to make sure that they do exactly what you asked them to do. Mm. Um, but we could just about let a company roll the, roll the aluminium. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. Also, we didn't have a choice. You know, that we couldn't afford to hire anybody to do it. Mm. We had to just figure it out ourselves. Um, do you think there's a connection between all of your work, um, or do you think they're all standalone pieces? Um, I think there's a there's an inevitable connection. Yeah, there's there's definitely a through line, which uh, I guess you don't really notice until you've done maybe three or four things, and then you look back and you're like, oh yeah, I'm, it's definitely the same person kind of thinking this stuff up, you know. Every, every project we've done has been a progression, I think. No, exactly. Yeah. So the connection between Archimedes and the well, 
the, the mylar, just the material, yeah. is a, a big connection there. We've and, and yeah, you, use, using a mirrored surface to move light around you know, rather yeah. than using uh, direct light. Like, yeah, there's, there's, there's a through line for everything else, but I guess the, the kinds of decisions that are being made, like why, why do this instead of doing that, that's kind of, that's the through line really, you know? Because we could have done something else. We could have made like a little tiny one, you know? <laughs> But the, the, do you know what I mean? Could we? <laughs> You'd have loved if we made a tiny one, but we didn't. We made a very big one instead. Yeah. Anyone else? Uh, does your work start also with little models and little work, or do you start um, experimenting with real one-on-one? In terms of how the light, and say, using uh, light and mirrors and smoke, we did, or Emmanuel did, lots of testing um, just with... Uh, a projector, a small smoke machine, and some mirror materials. In terms of the mechanics, um, we did a lot of prototyping with that. So start with the simplest thing possible. Uh, I, the main thing I want to say with Archimedes is the main thing I want to do is move. I want to move something. So what's the simplest way I can do that? And then build that up. But um, we didn't really start with models as, say, maquettes. We, the models that we made were all functional to test individual mechanisms rather than a sort of to get a sense of how something's going to look and, and to be honest i think um we spending what little money we had on making models when we could just make the real thing and find out what's wrong with it in the first place it just you know we, we didn't we didn't ha we just didn't have that luxury yeah. of going through yeah. that process yeah we had to just try and get it right the first time obviously fail and then try and get it right yeah, the second time and uh, naive like yeah it'd be fine yeah it'd be fine it'd fine be fine yeah. Find the, the bane of our lives. It'll yeah, be nice. <laughs> yeah. Now, I have this. Uh, didn't you try to take the small parabolic mirror and then reflect it with the big thing? It will, should make more or less the same effect. Uh, sorry, can you, can you say that again? I said that if you take all this uh, light, uh, maybe for lasers it can work, and you put a much smaller parabolic mirror and then you reflect it to some big thing like the Milo. But th then you would end up with a, a, a beam of light that's that large. Which, uh, in terms of this, uh. in terms of the scale, it's not really at human scale. Yeah, so but then you put the big thing that will reflect, like just not one reflection, but two. So the the mirror itself, um, yeah, this is actually a question we asked ourselves as well. Because I think that the main thing we want to do, uh -huh. the, the primary, um, or the, like the initial concept was collimation. We want to collimate some light. How do we do this? Wh so which, which means to make light stop diverging and become parallel yeah like in a f like in a flight sim or like like a rod like an actual just extruded rod of light um and the only way to do that simply is to use a parabolic yeah. um but to make that rod of light human scale you have to work at human scales i don't i don't understand which which mirror do you think we could have made smaller because so the thing is so pr um you can start with if i've understood correctly you have a, a primary source and then you spread that mm -hmm. with your a small parabolic and then that goes into your and then you, and then okay, you parabolic, and then then you, and you refocus. Them. We were lucky that uh, the the laser we were using was uh, a scan laser, so we could already create okay, the, that shape. Thank you. How long ago was Archimedes? Ooh, it's like when when did we start it? Like two thousand? Uh, no, 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 it's not two thousand. Uh, it's two thousand. It's I think two thousand eleven. Archimedes lived from two thousand eleven to about two thousand fifteen, sixteen. Yeah. That was the, that's roughly the length of a project. That's actually quite long for a project, to be honest. Um, I think Archimedes yeah. had lots of um, there were lots of small iterations along the way. So even in terms of how we controlled it, the control of it started off quite um, coarse, quite rudimentary. So it could only do very basic um, movements, uh, which were powerful in themselves. But when we we designed a new control uh, process for it, which gave us much um, better individual control over the mirrors, and it basically made it a new machine. So the, the actual mechanism itself had quite a long lifespan, but how it was performed changed quite a lot. So we used different light sources. We used uh, we started using a laser. Um, yeah, towards the end we used a laser. Yeah. yeah. So we really started off with just projectors. Then we had projectors and lights and the laser. Yeah, yeah. It's right to add up from there. The first version of it was quite small. We had a twelve mirror arrangement. Then we went to twenty four. Well, the first version of the second version. <laughs> yeah. But uh, uh, if your question is like, um, what was the life, the full lifetime of the project? It was about four or five years. That was the, the mm -hmm. from conception to when it went in back in the box. So what I'm wondering now is, is how like, are you coming up with your own pieces and then pitching those to artists? Are they coming to you? How is it right now in that um, in, career? I, I wish I knew how to pitch. I've never been able to pitch anything. I don't, 
I don't you, like you anti pitch. Yeah, I anti pitch. Um, yeah. People, people. I, I don't know why, but people have always approached me and said, like, I've got a tour coming up. I've got an album coming up. What you know? Can we do something together? And sometimes I, I can't because I'm on tour with someone else, or because I, I, you know, I just don't have an idea for that particular artist. Um, but no, it's, it's always been uh, from this, from this pro from the Archimedes project. Another sister project came up, which we haven't talked about, which is like an even larger mirror machine. Um, then this came along, and it's just been kind of like one, a one just rolls into the other. Yeah, it just rolls into the other, and it, um, all of my work has kind of come that way. It's always been I'll do a show, and someone at that show will come to me and say, "That was great. Can you do this for me?" I, th I think um, the anti-pitch nature of the way you present yourself means that you, the shows that you do, are you're definitely sure about it. Like. I'm definitely going to add something to this. Someone's asked me to do yeah. it. I can add something. Great. Yeah. So it's, I think that's been quite a good betting but, process. But to, I mean, to be clear, like, I don't have a website. I don't, you know, th this, this class is being done by our personal names because we don't have a company name. But there's just never really been any real need for that. There might be in the future. Maybe people just don't want to work with me anymore. And now I have to start looking for work. But I've been really lucky that that hasn't been the case. Um, yeah, there's, there's just been there's just, there's been a constant flow of interesting people who want to do interesting things and have usually just about enough money to do something good, and we put it on the road and and it breaks and we fix it and and whatnot. Sorry, can you please wait for the microphone? Sorry, man. It's the third time now. Man. Are you using a sonogram or for your uh, DMX controlling and stuff like that? Or um, so all the DMX we do you mean like how we generate the, Show, the design, yeah the, the we so we do we've done it all in um, V4. In fact, we tried using something a, a bit off the shelf, so some sort of like lighting-based software, but it wasn't suitable at all. Yeah. So we had to. The first thing we did was find someone who's really good at it, and then we picked his brains. Chris, yeah, yeah. We ate we ate Chris's brains. Yeah, and now we've, now David knows how to use V4, yeah. and I don't. Yeah, you should. Because you ate his brains, I didn't. Yeah, uh, but yeah, it's we've done everything in uh, V4, and it's if you, anyone's interested in creating. Um, DMX signals or video stuff, I can highly recommend it. Well, I'm interested, but I still can't learn it. So. All right. Well, I think that's all the time we've got. I think we're set. Thanks very much for coming. Um, I hope we I didn't bore I you too much. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> I, hope we've, I hope we've gotten at least something. I think we've rambled through a litany of things, but I hope there's something to take away. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for listening.